Not really. No, I mean, I'm just ready for anything. Um, you know, I will say, uh, you know, what I do for my day job is I run a small video game company. And the advantage of that is I'm not limited in terms of candor, like people who, you know, if you work for a big company, there's things you can't say. Right. And, um, I am actually quite enjoy saying things that people usually can't say. So, uh, don't worry about what kinds of questions you ask. Right. That's all. Okay, great. Now, Clark, Clarkin asks, you have talked before about how at some point a more coherent, simpler stack will simplify the web, vastly reducing the number of web developers needed. That seems like a good future. I feel like we might get an uninterpretable AI building on the stack you despise. What's your take on Codex? Um, I understood the first part of the question, but starting with the uninterpretable AI, I'm not sure I quite got it. So the, the, the idea is an uh, AI might arise that we can't understand? Well, yes, that it will be uninterpretable and okay. that that is dangerous. You probably know sure. about uh, AI alignment. And then specifically, the question is about Codex in this context. Wow. So there's a lot of components to this question. Um, what I would say is, um, I think that the, the reason why, okay, so let me give a little bit of background because because if people haven't heard me talk about this stuff before, which I'm sure most people haven't, there's, there's a bit of context missing. So the thing that we today call the World Wide Web um, is in the early days, it started out as a way to read documents across the network. And um, it was made for something more like we think of today as eBooks, right? And over the course of its history, it's metamorphed into this thing that is now supposed to be the portable instant application delivery platform, right? Which is a very different thing from what it was originally envisioned to be. Um, and this has some consequences. Uh, so uh, also, um, the time in which the web first arose, the mid-1990s, has some consequences because that was this period of time in which we were experimenting with programming languages that seemed more productive and higher level because they like didn't have type checking and stuff. And then uh, we, we woke up in the morning after that party with a huge hangover and said that was a bad idea. Uh, but afterward, um, you know, we were left with all these languages that still to this day, people realize that was a mistake, but because they were so popular, we haven't completely fixed that problem. So you have things like, you know, Python with kind of types in it now, sort of, but not really. Um, and you have TypeScript on top of JavaScript and stuff like that. But we still have this entire platform where people are writing these programs um, written in what was never really supposed to be a full programming language, actually, if you go back to its roots. Um, so that's all makes everything much more complicated than it should be. And if, if what you think the web browser is, is supposed to be um, an application delivery platform, right? Well, it's like, that's actually what the operating system originally was supposed to be, was the thing that lets you run programs. So like, why do we have an entire operating system that's like 30 million lines of code? And then a web browser that's now 30 million lines of code on top of that. And then all these things that sit in between, right? Um, so you know, if, if modern digital computers started sometime, you know, in the late 50s, maybe, um, and today it's more than 60 years after that, and computers have changed a lot, and most of the systems we use today are based on uh, designs for computers that not only that are designs for computers that are very different than the computers we actually use today. They also weren't the best designs for those computers anyway, because anytime things are new, you're like figuring it out and you're doing your first attempt and then you're doing your second attempt. And then one of these catches on and it's still not the best version, right? And so um, the, the entire software stack that we have today is this uh, product of this, what people call like historical path dependency, right? Um, and if you could like snap your fingers magically today, now that we know what we want computers to do in 2021 and how we want them to work and what kinds of software we want to run on them. If you could snap your fingers and replace everything we use with the simplest possible thing that will do effectively everything that we do today, it would be a tremendously simpler system, right? It would be 
less hardware, it would be less software. Uh, and that means it would be much easier to program and maintain, and it would be much uh, more robust to things like, firstly, uh, bugs, right? Because there would be a lot less, there would be a lot less software to have bugs, and then there would be a lot less opportunity for bugs to arise due to the complexity of different system components interacting. Um, and it would be much less attackable, right? And this attackability, um, I think, is something that people very much underestimate. Like, you know, I'm sitting here streaming with a desktop PC, and people think a desktop PC is a thing with a CPU and a GPU maybe in it now. But really, there's probably like 17 different computers in there. All of them are fully programmable, and you don't think about most of them, right? But an attacker can think about most of them um, and do things with them. And so um, I think we're in this time right now where um, we're, in, we're in a relatively peaceful time. Um, we're in a relatively comfortable time where we've had a lot of success with computer technology, right, to do all these things. Like, we couldn't have done this video meeting even, you know, like, 10 years ago, and maybe let's go 15 years ago, we had all the technology figured out to do this meeting, but it hadn't percolated through society enough that like people could just turn on their computer and like run a program to do this, right? So we're still reaping the benefits of this. Uh, because we're getting so many benefits from it, um, we're a little bit drunk on it and we're not looking, um, we're not looking at what we're actually doing and what the long-term consequences of it are. And so I think there are a lot of dangers. now. Whether there's a danger from an AI, I'm not sure, because I'm, I'm one of these people who's, um, who's, I don't know how hard AI is, right? Um, I will say that the, the recent developments in AI, like, um, you know, AlphaGo kinds of things, um, surprised me. I didn't think that we would solve that kind of problem for a long time. So there's reason to believe that uh, AI, full general AI would happen um, on a sooner time scale than I had previously thought, but but I'm still I'm still correcting for that. Maybe less than most people would. I think it's still a ways out. Um, that said, I honestly don't know. You know, um, it, it literally if if it's one weird trick that'll give you AI, like we could have it next week, right? So so we'll have AI sometime between next week and infinity. But I, I also don't think it's infinity. I think, you know, 100 years from now, we'll probably have it. And let, oh, okay, 100 years of normal societal progression from, or not, what we're in now is not historically normal, right? So 100 years of extrapolation of our current level of progress from now, we'll probably have AI. But the question is, can we do that with the kind of systems that we're building? And I find it a little bit unlikely. Um, the good news is that if nothing catastrophic happens, I think we'll kind of be forced in a soft way to clean some of this stuff up because anytime a programmer sits down to make things, that person's job is to like deal with both the complexity of the world and the complexity of the software environment that they're trying to operate in and like make stuff happen. And what's been going on is um, the world's been getting a little bit more complex because we're more technological than we used to be, but the software environment has been getting massively more complex, right? It's just more and more complicated every year. Um, and the amount of functionality that's happening per unit of complication is decreasing. Um, but, but the more work that any given programmer has to do to interface with all that is increasing, right? Even, you know, abstraction layers, uh, try to help with that, but they're deeply imperfect, right? And so we're going to reach a time where people kind of can't do anything anymore. Um, not anything that works, right? Um, we're already sort of seeing that where software, it's hard to quantify, but it seems pretty clear to me that software on average works less well than software used to on average, which um, if the story is that technology is advancing with no problems, then you shouldn't observe things like that, right? So anyway, so I'm not sure that AI is the biggest problem. Um, I hope it's not, right? Um, I, I hope that it's something much more like uh, we just kind of can't deal and we have to clean it up, right? Uh, Tomas asks, in your opinion, what makes a game good? Um, I'm, not, I'm not very much of a postmodernist, but there are, there are times when subjectivity must be uh, considered to be very important, and this is one of them, right? So really, it's like good to whom. Um, 
because what, what is somebody looking for when they come to your thing? And uh, I don't, I don't really try to answer that in general across all like, like what, what a big commercial company that's trying to maximize its revenue does is it's, it says, well, what, who can we sell this to and what do they want? And, um, let's try to maximize that function, right. For multiplied by what we can develop and whatever. Um, I don't do things that way. Um, what I do is I just say, well, I'm interested in some things. And so I'm making a game for an audience that is also interested in those things. Right. And so it's good for some particular sub audience that I don't even know who that is, but, but not even necessarily good for the average person who plays video games, right. Who, who wants to play, you know, call of duty Warzone or something like that is very different from the kind of thing that I do. Um, so, so then what is, what does good mean to me for that? It's well, it's like, what am I deeply interested in at the time kind of, right. Which, uh, you know, it actually changes with every game because um, what makes me really fascinated by something is um, like when I don't totally, when it feels deeply important to me, but I also don't totally understand it and have to grapple with it, with that subject matter, right? Like I'm not a big believer in simplistic morals, right? Like I wouldn't make a game with a, a moral and it's like the moral of the story is, you know, always look before you leap, right? It's like, oh, okay, that's cool if you're making a game for a little kid and you want to like propagate, you know, the, the mores, mores of your society. But like, if I'm making something for people like me or just in general adults, you need something better than that, right? And we were just talking about technological advancement, right? Um, if there's some kind of thing like artistic advancement, which some people will tell you there isn't, but if there is, um, it involves working hard at the edge of what you understand, right? And, and maybe trying to bring more things into the, into the uh, gamut of what you understand or what people generally understand, right? And so what'll happen is I will be fascinated with something um, and part of what makes me fascinated is I, I don't totally get it. It's important, but I can't see the whole thing. So what I try to do then is make a game that A, points toward the thing or, you know, tries to get close to touching it without, you know, you, you never quite can in those cases, but um, to, to do my best with that. And then B, um, the process of working so hard on a game for years, because these projects are long, um, helps me understand the things a lot better. And uh, just being, being with these subjects for as long as I do in these projects, at the end, I have a different understanding than I came out in the beginning. And then it's probably time to do something different the next time because I'm in a different place. So uh, and then what, what makes that good? I mean, obviously you could be, so that's like a methodology of how to design things sort of without any concrete steps. It's like the high level. So that could go badly. It's like, I could fail to, um, I mean, things could go badly functionally. Like you could make a game that accidentally is kind of unplayable because you didn't do a good job there. Um, it could go badly artistically. Like I really feel like, you know, I failed to capture the thing that I was going for here, right? Um, and what that means in specific changes every project, right? Um, so, and there are trade-offs, right? So in The Witness, um, very successful game personally to me, I feel. Um, there are small parts of it that I'm not happy with, right? There are individual things in it that are a little too ugly for what they're trying to do, a little bit too forced. Um, but it's because I'm not, I'm not perfect and I'm not able to do the best job on these things. Um, but those, those parts of it are small enough in relation to what we managed to do that I'm happy with it. Right. Um, if they were large, if I, if I played the game and like most of the puzzles in it felt ugly and forced, right. That would not be good. Um, I will say for anyone interested in this topic, um, maybe, uh, if I paste a link in here, will that go to people in the chat? 
Yeah, let me uh, let me spend about five seconds um, looking up. I'm looking up a video. Uh, I hope you guys don't hear that. Um, I popped open YouTube and it started playing a video. Uh, so there's a video that I did around the beginning of the development of the witness. Um, it was like um, after after I'd been a couple years into it, so I knew basically what the game was, but before the game was totally done. Um, and I gave it with my friend Mark, who uh, does a game called Miegakure, which is about four-dimensional space, which he's been working on forever. Um, but uh, it's not it's not done yet, but it's going to be done soon. And in there, we go through a number of design principles um, that that we use to guide what we do. And they're very different from the kinds of things that you'll hear from most people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Isaac Leonard asked a question which I was wanting to ask too, which is Rust. Mm -hmm. the, the game or the language? <laughs> oh, I presume it's the language. Pro probably the language. The language. So, so it's a one word question. Yeah, well, uh, I was wondering about Jai. I, haven't, I didn't find much about it when I was looking, so I'm interested in how it compares to another new low level <clears throat> compiled language. Um, here's, here's what I'll say. Uh, I mean, obviously, so, so before I say anything, you can take it for granted that I don't think Rust is the ideal language because I'm spending a great deal of my own time making something else, right? But that is gradually in the same sector, right? So the sector of languages that Rust is in um, is the, the systems programming languages, right? Which are the origin of that term is like, there are things you could write an operating system in, um, which didn't used to even be a differentiation, but at some point, you know, there started to be programming languages that were like high level and interpreted and required a heavy runtime, or maybe would stop and garbage collect for a long time or something. And those aren't things you want in your operating system because if it's stopping, you know, every time you run a program or something, that's that's just an undesirable property. Um, although to be, that said, it's, the term systems programming language is much more of a heuristic than a definite. Like actually, you could use any programming language to build a system probably, almost. Um, so, so the thing that Rust does, uh, which, which I think is a good idea, right, is that they, they have this idea that, you know, a, a lot of previous programming languages would provide memory safety, uh, which is, um, <laughs> so if I, if I go uh, define everything, um, it'll take like an hour to answer the question, right? But like, um, in, in older programming languages, it was very easy to accidentally overwrite memory somewhere. Um, actually, some older programming languages prevented you from doing that, like languages like Pascal, for example, um, prevented certain classes of, of memory overruns by not letting you use pointers arbitrarily. Um, but then Pascal is kind of why C was invented, because you couldn't manipulate pointers arbitrarily, right? So, um, uh, the class of languages that are not systems programming languages tried to provide more memory safety by having a very heavy handed control over, um, over how memory works. So like Lisp, even going back to that or more modern, uh, functional programming languages, you, you know, the, the memory is all managed by a system. And when you don't need some particular piece of data anymore, you just forget about it. And then the system realizes you've forgotten about it and reclaims it. Although that's computationally expensive, it's considered to be worth the expense. Okay, so Rust changes this, uh, this approach by saying, you know what, if, if the real problem we want to solve is memory safety, um, we're going to do it uh, using static analysis as opposed to um, runtime uh, heavyweight uh, garbage collection kind of stuff. And I think that that's a good approach. Um, the place the place where I differ from the Rust community on this um, is, um, and, and I'm trying to figure out, so, so for the particular language I'm working on, the community is currently very small. And I'm trying to figure out as it grows how to keep it smart and not like, you know, jingoistic 
over propaganda points, right? So the propaganda point with Rust that it, that is true, uh, or starts with truth, is that memory safety is a good thing and prevents certain classes of bugs. And some of those bugs are are bad, right? So like it, classically in C programs, people could just by just by putting uh, maliciously constructed user input into like an input field in a program, um, they could cause a buffer overrun if that program wasn't careful and most of them weren't, uh, that could cause them to take control over the computer, right? That's a very bad thing. And so the design of Rust is to prevent that kind of stuff. And it's a good thing to prevent. Um, the thing is that the Rust community today uh, seems to think that that somehow means almost all bugs and that somehow programs are going to be massively better if you do this. And I don't agree with that. Um, in fact, like if, if my goal is to make software that just works better um, and I look at what percentage of bugs, for example, in the games that we ship, what percentage of, of time that we ever spent debugging was memory safety problems? Um, you know, on as a single digit percentage, it rounds down to zero, right? Almost all of our bugs are other things having to do with just that that what we're trying to program is really complicated and, and the programs are just trying to do really complicated things. And so, whereas I think memory safety is everything, all else being equal, a good thing, um, I don't even think it's the most important thing. It might be if you're in a particular domain, like I'm building security software or something or, or things that, you know, absolutely need to be secure, uh, you might rank, you know, uh, security against buffer overruns as the most important thing. Um, that said, if you did that, there are multiple approaches to that and, and to achieving that kind of security and Rust's static analysis is one of them, right? Um, in terms of the kind of stuff that I've been working on, it's much more about how do I, how do I let you have a lot of expressive power without a using the losing the ability to talk to the machine at a very low level and control what it's doing <clears throat> and b actually without being encumbered by too much static analysis because the downside i think to what rust is doing is that it's more of a pain in the butt to write programs and um, there's certain programs that you can't really write while staying in the safe part of rust and Again, you know, people who are excited about Rust will actually tell you that's a good thing. You didn't want to write those programs to begin with, but I don't agree with that because what I do is really hard. Like games like The Witness, um, it, it took us six and a half years. Um, I started out with money at the beginning of that. I was broke by the end. I was actually six million dollars in debt by the end. Um, I was on my last legs, like energetically, like working hard on something for six and a half years is a long time, right? If it had taken 10% longer even to make that game, like an extra six months, I don't know if it would have succeeded, right? I mean, maybe we would have had to release it like unfinished and it would have been a worse game or something, right? So I felt very directly this pain of how hard it is to make complicated software. And my goal is to minimize that, which actually, if you go back to the creation of all these high level programming languages from the past 30, 40 years, that was sort of their goal too, right? Like, let's just make programming easier. Um, but I believe I have a, a different view on that than, you know, that the architects of those languages had. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, this has been a long answer, so I'll kind of cut it off here. But I'll just say that um, uh, our focus is on helping people understand the program that they're making, helping it easily interface with the rest of the world in terms of... Um, being able to analyze the program, but the analysis. <laughs> okay, so one last point of comparison is the static analysis built into Rust is um, it's built into Rust. It's in the semantics of the programming language, right? And that actually follows on uh, decades of of the kinds of approach that people have been doing in academia. They're like trying to do type algebra stuff to help make programs more provable. Um, you know, Rust's approach is a little bit more down to earth than that. Um, but but related in the sense that the trend there is to build things into your language semantics that improve provability of correctness. And the problem with that, that I think is um, there are limits to what you can do there. Like even going back to the 60s, all of these like prover kinds of systems want a closed world assumption in order to be able to prove things, right? As soon as there's like some entities in, in your prove logic that you don't know anything about, then 
suddenly you find yourself being able to prove very little because you know those are like singularities in your ability to reason. Um, and so what ends up happening is you build these structures that are very, very laborious and very tight in order to enable you to prove these things. And the, the problem is even after you've done that, the kinds of things you're able to prove are like, they're very general. I don't know how to say this. Um, let me try to explain it by, by going to a totally different direction, right? If you're writing a particular game or a game engine, or you just run a company or you're a personal developer and you like to do things a certain way, you've developed your own code base that you reuse over time. Um, there's just things that you like to do right, or ways that that system works. So for example, in the game engines that we make, there's a thing called an entity, right, which is a, a general data structure. In the game we're working on now, there's like the, the abstract version of an entity, but you make concrete things of that. So like a player character is one kind of entity, and like a rock is another kind of entity, and a gate that you can open and close is another kind of entity. Very common thing, right? And in these game engines, you have ways of managing the entities so that, um, the operations you do on them, uh, you don't, you know, are uh, are control. Like, okay, when you create an entity, there needs to be memory for that. If if some of the fields on the entity need storage, like strings or whatever, there needs to be memory for that. When you release the entity, um, you know, uh, it needs to go away. Uh, but you don't want to use very slow allocators and deallocators for that. But then also, you have many other entities in the game world that are trying to refer to that entity, right? And um, what do you do? And this starts to sound like, you know, a general like strong point or weak pointer problem, like you have in other programming languages. But if you try to solve it that way, it becomes very conf <clears throat> confusing. So what game engines tend to do, because they have game engines have a structural advantage over general abstract software, which is they render things frame by frame. At the end of a frame, it's a natural time when a lot of our work has come to a close. And there's this stark differentiation between long-term information that lasts across frames and short-term information that's like temporary stuff, right? And so what game engines tend to do is say, okay, at the frame boundary um, uh, is when entities actually go away. And if you destroyed an entity in the middle of the frame, we actually don't worry about it. You might put a flag on it that says it's destroyed, but we don't do any of these memory operations and we don't recycle the ID or anything like that until the end of the frame. And that helps you reason about the system and when you write software in the middle, you don't have to check stuff like, did my weak pointer go to null or whatever, right? Like that, that's just not an issue and it greatly simplifies things. So what happens is, you know, in various systems, we build up conventions like this. And kind of what we want to do then is, um, you know, we want to, uh, um, when we, we want a kind of static checking that works with our conventions because those are really the things, um, like the semantics of the programming language are enforced by the programming language, but the semantics of our own personal conventions are only enforced by like, does the program happen to run and seem to compile? And like, is there someone doing code reviews to like catch your things, right? But doing code reviews is a great deal of labor and it's very easy to miss things. So if you can do your own uh, static checking uh, at compile time, but for the kinds of things that you personally care about, like, look, this kind of entity operation, which nobody else in the universe knows about except our game engine, we wanna make sure that that only happens at certain times. So we're going to write some checking to make sure that you only call this function at certain times or from within certain files or like, um, you know, you can only put certain data types on this data structure. And if you put something that's not that, that's going to trigger a code review so that we know to go look at it and make sure it's okay. Like these are like relatively advanced software development things that you would like to automate and make um, as quick and as perfect as possible. And so that's the kind of thing that we're working on. Um, and okay, the last thing to say <laughs> is um, it's not that I don't think, uh, it's not that I don't think memory safety is important. It's just that um, I think other bugs are also very important. And I think that if you can minimize the other bugs, you also minimize memory safety bugs, right? Like you'll find them, if you, if you add ways of minimizing the other bugs, those same features will help you minimize memory safety bugs. So yeah, okay, sorry, long answer for people who don't care about programming languages. Okay.
Uh, Bram Cohen asks, when is Miga Kure going to ship? Um, I would like if it shipped as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> Mark seems to be uh, just very content to make the game as good as he can, which I think is admirable. There's, of course, in all of our lives, a trade-off between that and how many things that we make. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I actually haven't seen him. He's been traveling for a while. Um, but last time I hung out with him, because uh, we do work days together sometimes, um, he was he was feeling like it was rolling to uh, the end of development. You know, he he had figured out. You know what? I shouldn't say that much. Like, it, if he wanted to announce these things, he would. Never mind. Um, but uh, I don't know any c concrete date. Um, but I hope I hope not too long from now because I think it's a um, I think it's going to be a really interesting game that a lot of people will appreciate. Okay. James Friesen asks, what would you like to be done about games exploiting people's gambling vulnerability, like many mobile games or loot boxes? Should it be regulated by law, like casinos? I think there are a lot of questions like outside this question or, or surrounding this question, right? Um, So on the one hand, I'm really much, very much not a fan of, of that aspect of, of games, right? The kinds of games that are there to like just play tricks with your psychology and, you know, exploit you into, you know, doing certain kinds of behaviors, mostly involving paying money. Um, I, don't, I don't like that at all. I've definitely given some speeches that made other game developers very angry, where I very directly said to them that what you're doing is... Uh, immoral and unethical, and uh, you shouldn't do it. People don't people don't like it when other people in their same industry say stuff like that, right? Um, now, the one thing that makes this complex is that there is there's a lot of gray area. There's a huge slippery slope, right? Like going back to the beginnings of games, some games were fun and some games were not fun. Why were the games that are fun fun? Well because they hook into something in your psychology about things that you like to do. And so the art of game design is actually about understanding your psychology and how it works to some degree. But the question is, how are you, as, as a designer, how are you working with that, right? Are, are, you, are you treating your audience as someone you respect, right? Or are you treating your audience as someone who you're trying to extract resources from? And those lead to two very different kinds of decisions. Now, okay, so to the part of the question that's like, should, should this be illegal? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, here's the thing. Um, I, I don't personally, for example, have any kind of gambling addition, addiction. Sorry, um, Gambling doesn't really appeal to me at all. Um, so I presume that the reason gambling is outlawed is in large part because some people are highly susceptible to this kind of thing. Um, and then maybe even for people who aren't, um, I mean, it is gambling is essentially an unproductive activity and one in which there's a large incentive for the person operating the gambling scenario to like cheat anyway, right? Or, or to do... Um, Whatever to do whatever they can to just get more money out of you than they already are to 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 tweak the odds and whatever. Um, that said, I'm also of the mind that the law today is just completely absurd. Like I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? Do you know how many laws you broke today so far? Um, it's probably a lot, right? And so outlawing more things. Um, just, just in general, outlawing more things in more weird contexts doesn't seem like it's going in the right direction. Um, so I don't actually know, right? Um, like I've gone to Las Vegas a few times. When I go there and I'm walking through all the slot machines and stuff, I feel really dirty. I feel like I'm in a place I don't want to be. Um, is that what 
all of the United States would feel like if gambling were legal across the United States? Probably not because it would be more, like the reason Las Vegas is that way is because it's the concentrated place where people go to gamble. Um, so, but I, I don't know. It's a complicated question. I don't, I don't think I have much more to say than, than this, um, except that if you could show that it, that that kind of thing was doing a lot of damage to people's lives, um, then outlawing it is a good, at least a good temporary step. Like if you need to halt some damage while you figure out really what the right approach is, um, that said, we don't, we're not very good at outlawing things temporarily, right? That's not the way things work. Um, and also, I mean, those kinds of games, depending on how, uh, depending on how obvious the gambling part is, those kinds of games are illegal in many parts of the world already. Um, so I don't know, like, like it just, I think at some point you have to look at particular cases and judge those particular cases. Um, but I will just say, I'm not a fan and um, if we believe in games as a medium where we can do new and interesting things, uh, where we in, take interesting viewpoints, uh, or, um, you know, have an interesting kind of experience or expression that you couldn't have in another medium, um, I don't think that has much to do with gambling, right? <laughs> we know what gambling is. And, and we should be going in this way away from gambling if we want that medium to progress as well. Unfortunately, there is a lot of money in the gambling thing. Well, uh, just to add on really quickly, even without talking about gambling with money, there are lots of games that skirt the edges of gambling with time, where any roguelike, any game that has uh, random upgrades turns into a kind of gamble because, you know, the uh, the play experience is variable based on these random elements. Yes, and in fact, that goes back to what I was saying before about games uh, exploiting player psychology in some way, right? <clears throat> so if you go back to the behaviorist stuff like BF Skinner and so forth, <clears throat> one of the things that they discovered uh, in those days, um, I think 1960s, I'm not quite sure, uh, maybe 50s, maybe even before that, um, is that you know if you're giving rewards to some poor animal you have locked in a cage in order to experiment on it, um, then it is much more responsive and interested in randomized rewards than regular rewards, right? So, um, you know, if you get one little food pellet <clears throat> every time the buzzer goes on, um, that's not as compelling as if you sometimes get none and sometimes get one and sometimes get five. Right. And you can't. And the idea behind why this is true is, well, you know, as mammals trying to explore in the wild or trying to survive evolutionarily, we're always looking for the patterns to that we can exploit uh, to increase survivability. Right. We like to see patterns and recognize them and understand them so that we can act better uh, interfacing in interface with those patterns. Right. And if there's no pattern, if there's just like one pellet every time you push the lever, it's like, okay, I figured it out. Cool, right? But if it's completely random, your brain doesn't ever really know that it's completely random because there's not, a, in, in nature, uh, on, on the level of human experience, there's not a lot of things that are completely random, right? Most things are the output of some complex system. And if you can at least even form a very vague approximation to that system that helps you predict it with some degree of, of uh, accuracy, um, then that's better than not being able to predict it at all. And so our brains are trying to predict the pattern in cases like that, right? And, and just to add and, uh, on. Rory, uh, oh, it's, it's great you're talking and actually it's fine. You have interesting things to say, but for a lot of people also wish that they could ask questions. So perhaps we could move on to uh, another question, if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, uh, let me just close that off by saying, uh, yeah. um, even, even with games like roguelikes and stuff like that, I think it could be unethical, right, to do that kind of design. Um, it really depends. Um, on the other hand, if you somehow say, I'm going to issue any kind of randomness whatsoever, then you're probably making a kind of a boring, if it's that kind of a game. And so this is actually, um, it's actually difficult to try to figure out 
what is the right thing in, in these cases? Um, I, I can't give you a blanket answer of even what's right. That said, I don't, I don't specialize in those kind of games. So maybe if I'd spent 15 years making that kind of game, I could give you a more specific answer. Uh, Fiona L. asks, in your programming language endeavors, have you found it better to be opinionated, excluding uses that don't match your vision, or inclusive to try to reach a larger audience? What trade-offs do you make for wider adoption versus clarity of focus? Um, so broadly speaking, in any kind of endeavor, whether you're starting a company or, or doing something creative or whatever, right? You have this question, what do I have to add, right? Like, I, I want to go write a short story. What do I have to add that everybody else who hasn't ever written it, who everybody else who's written a short story hasn't already added, right? I, I must be bringing something to it that, that makes this interesting in order for this to be a story that people are going to want to read, right? It's pretty hard in the case of short stories because there's been so many. That said, there's something in people's psychology that likes stories because we learn things from stories, right? So that actually, that's a thing to add to the previous, uh, the previous discussion is that actually storytelling is kind of an exploit of people's psychology as well. And, um, you know, there, there's some question about whether a lot of the stories that we have are ethical because they're using this mechanism for one thing and they're they're redirecting it for another thing. But anyway, um, so if you start a company, for example, I'm going to, I want to try to go into business doing some particular kind of thing. Um, if I do the same thing that everybody already in that business is doing, I'm making it really hard for myself because now I'm competing with them and I have no differentiating factor, right? I have to come up with some reason why I'm different. <clears throat> so when making a programming language, it's like that too. It's like, why, why should this exist, right? Like if, it, if I just want it to exist because it's just mine, that's not a very good reason, <laughs> like objectively in the world, right? You have to have um, a, good, a good reason why people should be interested in the thing. And, and again, if you're being ethical, right? Um, if, I, if I'm going up to someone and saying, this is a good programming language, I should have an honest answer why. Like, what does it do that all these other things don't do, right? And so, well, people have been making programming languages for decades, right? And uh, a lot of them, sort of what happens is there are, there are societal trends about what people think is a good idea, right? Uh, and then, when you make something, most of the people making that thing are making it within that trend, right? So the things that are made share common roots in terms of motivation, right? So in terms of programming languages, some of these common motivations were, you know, we want to make higher level programming languages to make programmers as uh, productive as possible, which is itself high level has sort of been a confused concept. That's a, that's a little bit of a different discussion. But another one of them has been, um, there are a couple of different kinds of inclusiveness actually that have been motivating for people, right? One of them has been, we want more different kinds of people to be able to program, right? Uh, we don't just want it to be somebody whose career is programming, but like, let's just say you work in a biology lab and you mostly think about, you know, biological processes, but you need to go automate something. Should you be able to do that? And I think the answer is probably yes. And you shouldn't have to write a weird gnarly C program in order to do that, right? Um, uh, so that's that's one kind. And then another kind is more like, um, you know, should kids be able to program, right, versus adults and, and whatever. And, and I think the answer to all these things is yes, right? But when every programming language tries to do that, then they all start making the same kinds of decisions, right? And, and this is what happened is, um, oh, oh, sorry. The other kind of inclusiveness is more like a mixed skill inclusiveness, like, okay, we're all professional programmers on this software team, but we have some people who are relatively inexperienced, right? They're just out of school or whatever. And then we have some people that not only have been programming for 30 years, but they also have been working on this particular system for like 15 years and know it like the back of their hand, right? And all of those, people, you know, need to somehow collaborate on this project, like experienced people and inexperienced people working on the same thing, right? And so <clears throat> what this has meant is that programming languages make decisions um, in that direction. 
uh, of trying to, uh, okay, you know when like you're, you're going to have a, a baby. So you like baby proof your house and like you put, you put stuff in all the electrical sockets and you make sure there's nothing that you're going to yank a cable and like pull an appliance off or whatever. <clears throat> the programming languages have all been doing that for decades because like, oh, the inexperienced person or the person who's not a professional programmer will have a hard time doing this thing. And um, the decision that I made at the outset was I'm, I'm not going to actually take those decisions for granted. Like all things being equal, it's better if more people can use something than fewer people, probably. <clears throat> uh, however, however, if I assume that that is mandatory, uh, then I may be leaving behind some very interesting things that uh, other other languages have uh, also left behind. And I want to explore that territory and see what's good. So I've been approaching it in a very opinionated way. Um, I have a chef kind of a model, right? And not a, uh, you know, not a, a customer pleasing kind of a model. So it's like, I'm making a particular thing. If you don't like it, you can go eat at someone else's restaurant. It's, it's cool by me, right? He, this is what we do here. And, um, you know, to the extent that we can make what we do uh, usable by the maximum number of programmers possible, that's good. But I don't want it to compromise what we do from the beginning of design. Um, Felipe Silva asks, do you see any promising way out of the loss of information due to civilization breakdown, a way that might exist now that did not exist before? So I was at a conference a couple years ago. Um, I don't remember the name of this project, um, but I'm sure you can look it up. Um, there's a project where like this guy is like inscribing all of Wikipedia and the Library of Congress like on a crystal and trying to launch it to the moon so that it like it stays there in a relatively, um, you know, preserving environment. Um, I, I wish I could remember what it was called. Uh, there are things like that. I don't particularly know that that's the right thing to do. I would rather just let's try not to screw it up. Um, that said, there has never been a civilization in the history of human civilization that lasted beyond a certain amount of time. However, the world used to be big enough that if one civilization like totally fell, there was at least something major going on somewhere else, right? And we're kind of like not that separated anymore right? Even with something relatively like, okay, I, I don't mean to minimize any difficulties that people have had due to coronavirus, but like you could have imagined the actual virus being a lot more deadly than it was, right? And yet we had severe problems dealing with that globally, right? And to today, you know, a year and a half after this thing started, like we still have highly elevated prices of many commodities in the United States because like just global manufacturing and shipping uh, has been disrupted to some degree. Uh, this particular disruption does not look like it would be that bad. Um, but um, A, that just means we got a little lucky this time and might not next time. B, the thing about failures, like if you look at failures of, of complex systems, right? <clears throat> like in engineering disciplines, right? Like if you make nuclear reactors or airplanes or something um, that are very safety critical and where people die if they mess up, um, all of those disciplines have, you know, after something went wrong, we go and do a very, very serious analysis of what went wrong and why. And what always happens in these cases is that multiple failures cascaded because a couple of unlucky things happened at the same time and the system would have handled one of the failures but a second one destabilized this other thing that was supposed to help you handle the first one and whatever, right? And so failures cascade, even as, as simple as like um, a, a relatively benign failure happened and the operator's attention was focusing on that thing, right? And thought this other thing that then popped up was related to that thing, but it was a different problem. And so that problem wasn't handled, right? And so <clears throat> I think the biggest danger is uh, multiple uh, somewhat contemporaneous um, disruptions, right? And what, what happens in response to that? And I think what we should do is, is focus on building things that are 
more robust, right? Because yeah, you could try to save the information somewhere. Um, maybe that's not a good idea. Uh, I don't know how many people have read the book Canticle for Leibowitz, uh, but that that book is all about saving the information, and uh, it ends interestingly as well. So I don't know. <laughs> Um, Yitz asks, what was important to you about the story of Braid? I'm going to have to speak about this in very general terms because to, to me, if I'm creating a piece of art or even I'm viewing a piece of art that I really care about or that means something to me, which I will say uh, is less, it's less common for me to experience that now than it used to be, maybe because I'm old, but maybe also because art is even more shallow than it used to be. Um, it, it always feels to me wrong and uh, maybe a little bit sacrilegious to try to break down and talk about what something is about because in the process of doing that, you actually miss the intangible, uh, difficult to perceive, difficult to capture things that actually make the thing great and beautiful and powerful. Uh, so I don't like to do that. Like if I go see a movie, I, I don't want to talk to somebody about the movie after the movie, right? If it was a good movie, you know, I just, it feels wrong to me. Um, and so, um, and then, and then doubly so for things that I make, because um, I feel that the job of, of doing, do the right form of whatever expression that you slaved over to make this piece of art, like is that piece of art, right? So if, if I make a business out of walking around telling you what the piece of art means, then it's then why did I make the thing? Why didn't I just you know become a professional lecturer and just tell you about about the facts, right? <clears throat> um, but I will say that that some of the <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to take a drink of water for a second. I don't know what's going on with my voice today. Maybe I'm catching coronavirus. Um, I mean, I was just very, uh, very, the problem is anything I'm going to say is going to be so general as to be almost useless, right? But I was very interested in what does it mean to be a human being in the universe and how, how can I even deal with the fact that that's what's going on, right? Just from, from a very foundational statement. Like if, if you really, um, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, but I, it's hard to say more than that. Um, I will say <laughs> one of the things that we're still working on, we had hoped it would be released by now, but it's not yet released, um, is the, the Braid Anniversary Edition, uh, which is full of lots and lots of commentary about the game. Um, however, almost none of it is about like what, what the story means, um, because I'm allergic to that. How, uh, you know, what I'm thinking right now is um, some of these answers I'm giving are quite long, and I'm concerned we might run out of time without uh, getting to as many questions as we would like. Should I like keep them shorter, or what do you uh, want? Up to you. Uh, okay. Short is good. Um, All right. So, uh, yeah, there are plenty of questions. That's, we're certainly not short of those. Uh, Steph asks, what is the artistic expression of games that is inherent only to them? We're still trying to figure that out. Like that's part of what my job is and that's part of what many game designers job is. Not as many as I would like because a lot of game designers are just doing the commercial product thing. Most of them actually. Um, but if you think about like what a video game is basically, um, the way I, here's the way I think about it personally, uh, su view subject to change. Uh, is, you know, you have this computer, it's running very fast, it runs some rules on the state of the game world, um, and in response to your inputs, it changes that state and produces outputs, right? And it does this in a loop, and for a turn-based game, that's like a slower loop, right? But for an action game, it's a faster loop. And in basic structure, that is... Kind of similar to what the universe is in that 
in the universe, there's some previous state and there's some laws that act on that previous state to produce a new state, right? And so if you're interested in contemplating the universe, you could do worse than to design video games, actually. Um, it's not the same thing at all, um, but by messing around with these toy universes that are simpler than our regular one, um, you can uh, you can maybe gain some insights into what this process, this creative. So, <laughs> the the thing about this loop that uses rules to act on old state to generate new state is um, like somehow that's magical. Somehow it generates surprises and somehow it generates a great deal of interest. And you don't even quite need a video game to go uh, to see that level of surprise. Like if you go to Stephen Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science, uh, which is from like 20 years ago or something, he has this set of finite state machines, right? Which are cellular automata, which are, uh, much simpler than a video game, but again, it's a series of rules that you apply to an input and generate an output. And what he shows is that even with very, very, very simple systems, like very simple universes, um, it's not that hard to generate complexity and surprise. And but 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 where does that come from, right? Like, what does that mean? And so, when I design a game, so as a designer, that's really what interests me a lot of the time. And then when I'm making something for people like part of like what this medium can do that other media can't really do is like genuinely show you the operation of that mechanism and the surprise that results. Um, that said, the games that I have done have, have not exactly done the dynamic version. Like you can imagine a dynamic version of that. So a game like Spelunky, for example, for people who have played that, is there's things happening in a world and it's delightful sometimes because you get bitten really hard. It's like a hard game where you die a lot. And like you die somehow through something that was a surprise, but also was mostly predictable from like, you knew this was coming in the back of your head because of the things and where they were arrayed in, in the level, right? Um, so that's a dynamic version of surprise. And then the one that I do so far in my games is a static version of that, where there are these rule systems that are not playing themselves out dynamically on the world state, but they exist in the background. They're like the rules of the puzzle dynamics. And those then can interact in this complex way to generate surprise in the corners of those rule systems. Um, and so that to me is what's fascinating about video games as a medium. It, it's not the only thing by any means, but it's what I think about the most and what I specialize in. <clears throat> Martin asks, Traditionally, we had traditionally asked this question. What are some of your major disagreements with Scott Alexander? <laughs> okay, I only have one. Um, I, you know, I haven't, I certainly haven't read anything he ever wrote, but uh, one thing that I did read uh, some years ago, uh, but it's one of his more famous posts, so probably a lot of people remember it, um, was. Uh, there's actually a couple of them, a couple of cost disease uh, postings, right? About like, you know, why why is it so expensive? You know, stuff like healthcare or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, do, what are the ideas behind this? And and he wrote this posting that was like, oh, here's what I here's all these different. You know, let me let me think about it and try to try to talk about what's happening in all these different industries that's making costs go up and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I'm really interested in this topic, right? Um, so uh, I read, I was like, well, where does this idea of cost disease come from? Oh, I see that Tyler Cowen wrote a PhD thesis on it, but it was based on earlier stuff. Okay, it goes back to this dude named Baumol um, who wrote a paper about this in like the 1960s or something. And I saw that he had written a book in, in like 2000 something. So I, I got this book off Amazon and read it. It's actually not a very good book. It's a very sloppily put together book. That's like some research papers from his grad students sandwiched together. It's like not really good, except the first like two or three chapters are really good. Um, I, you know, the, the, the red pill metaphor has been politicized. Uh, so, but I don't mean to say this in that way, but I read like chapter one and two of this book and I felt like I'd been completely red pilled on economics. Um, 
and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this basic argument, but, but what he says is, um, okay, cost disease isn't about industries, uh, having problems. It's just math. And the reason it's just math is because, um, we have this thing called the CPI, right? Which is how we measure inflation. And the CPI is an average of a bunch of different kinds of goods. And there's a stagnant sector, uh, which is things that don't naturally get cheaper over time, like things that involve human labor, right? And uh, there, I forget the name for the other sector, the efficient sector or something, which is technological things, things that we get better at making over time, like computers, where you get mu much more computer for your money as time goes on. And the CPI is an average of both of these two different kinds of things. And therefore, it's going to thread in the middle. Um, so therefore, so, there's always some class of goods that's rising exponentially in cost relative to the average. And so no matter how efficient various industries are, um, some of them are just more technological and some are less. And in the ones that are less technological and more human, you're going to have cost disease and it's just math. And so then I went back and read the Slate Star Codex thing. Oh, and in that book, he says, it's just math, but people are going to try to figure out all kinds of reasons, like they're going to say this and say that and say that. And I go back to that article and he said this and that and that. And I'm like, okay, clearly he didn't read this book. Um, so uh, that's the only thing that uh, that comes to mind as, as a disagreement. But I do have to credit that article as getting me interested in the topic and inspiring me to go out and read all this other stuff. But um, then I was like, yeah, I don't actually like the original article. <laughs> Uh, Caleb Rudnick asks, in your meditation and malaise Q&A video, you mentioned that you have some favorite forms of meditation, but it would take a long time to get into detail about them. Would you be open to sharing your favorite forms of meditation today? Wow. Oh, um, you know, I don't hold myself up as a very good example when it comes to meditation, and I don't, I don't teach meditation because I d don't do it nearly as often as I should, and therefore... I'm not as good at it as I would be if I did that. Um, but it has been very beneficial to me. Um, and th the problem is that the kinds of meditation that are my favorite are, um, they're less like activities than some other forms of meditation, right? So if you take something like, like TM, which I honestly don't like very much, um, it's very clearly an activity. And so you can learn how to do it pretty straightforwardly. Um, something like Vipassana, also pretty clearly an activity. Um, but some of the other stuff that I like to do, uh, for example, um, certain kinds of like internal uh, self-inquiry from, from the lineage of Ramana Maharshi, um, they don't exactly have steps. You're not exactly doing a process. And so it's very hard to explain, especially in a venue like this. Um, wh what I would recommend for stuff like that is to just find somebody in person, again, hard in the days of COVID, but find somebody in person who you can study this stuff with because personal presence is a tremendous aid in uh, the ability to learn these things. Um, but But that kind of that kind of inquiry has uh, has been very beneficial to me, I would say. Mo Zhu asks, are there any aspects of, say, Bray that you think is popularly misunderstood? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to get into it too much. Okay, I will say one thing about it, which is... Um, There, there are always mistakes you make as an artist in some, or maybe they're not mistakes, but but there are ways in which you fail to predict things. And so in in, in Braid, uh, I was both putting a lot of thought in the game design and into the text part of it and putting a lot of ideas in there. And one of the ideas that's in there is a metaphor about the atomic bomb, right? And it is a relatively important part of the, the game. Um, but uh, what happened on the internet after the game came out is that a lot of people wanted to like s interpret the game in a way that simplifies everything out and centralizes it around this idea so that that's the only thing it's about right and i guess i guess again that's a natural aspect of the human desire to 
complete the pattern and, and to see the most clear, uh, simplest, uh, most answered version of this question that you have about what does this thing mean? And, um, I don't know. To me, to me, that kind of approach, unfortunately, feels uh, really reductive and stuff. And so um, that's what I, th I think one of the bigger, there's actually two big misunderstandings. Of, again, I shouldn't know, you know, I have to be very careful about how I say this kind of thing, because it's not my business to tell people how to interpret something I made either, right? Again, I think, I think my job is to make the thing and give it to people. So you know what, I'm going to shut up. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Okay. Um, yes, uh, so John Miller asks, have you looked at Urbit? If so, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I have met some of the Urbit people. Um, I, uh, I'm actually also having, having a meeting with someone else about Urbit, uh, next week. Um, it is not a system that I have used uh, personally yet. Um, I will say that with the whole the whole gamut of distributed system slash crypto slash decentralized authority stuff, I was never that big on historically because um, in my observation, centralized systems are just much more robust and efficient than decentralized systems, right? And I always felt like I lived in a free country where decentralizedness wasn't going to matter to me. Um, I feel differently about that lately, right? Especially with all these online platforms, um, silencing people or just down regulating their expression even um, for things that six weeks later are common knowledge, right? Um, so there's not even, there's not even, uh, any awareness of irony in this whole situation. Um, I don't know where that's going to go. And so my opinion has shifted on that kind of system. I, I see it as being more potentially important uh, than I used to. But because I don't have a lot of past experience with this kind of system, I don't have a lot of opinions about it. Okay. Um... Greg asks, how much of the complexity of the witness was in the engine as opposed to creating artistic assets, broadly speaking? How can aspiring game devs with a programming skill set get better at creating art applicable to games? I mean, they're both really complicated. Like making a 3D first person game engine is pretty hard, right? Um, depending on what you want the feature set of that engine to be. And the feature set of the witness involved being able to see all the way across the world because that was important to the game design and that just had implications in terms of what what you do right and you know we were starting we started that engine in like 2009 which is a really long time ago in terms of how fast computers were right and that influences like for slower computers you have to work harder to make certain things possible right um that said the the actual design part and the, the artistic aesthetic part is also the most complicated thing I've ever done in that dimension. So they, they were both complicated. Um, in terms of what you can do, like I kind of don't know, I don't know of any magic bullet advice. Like the way, the way that you make games that are good is you start by making games that are bad and you get better at it, right? The first games I made were pretty bad. Um, the important thing is to have your critical faculties enabled while looking at your own work, right? So, so my personality, actually, when I was younger, um, I was definitely one of these people who was very judgment and probably still am, uh, but maybe a little bit more tempered, um, very judgmental, like looking at things, not liking a lot about art or how things are organized or whatever, and probably complaining too much about those things. Um, and I think in society, sometimes that kind of personality can be seen negatively, right? Because you, you're just complaining about stuff or whatever. But that is actually a part of the human personality that has a great deal of potential positive application because 
if you put yourself in a position where you're actually making things that you can turn that critical faculty onto, then it is very, very valuable because that is what helps you make those things good, right? And so, um, you know, I'm, this is the thing that people don't understand about like, you know, sometimes to this day, I still get heat for being like grumpy about things or, or not satisfied with things. But what people don't understand is that's the same eye that I turn onto my own. In fact, my personal eye for my own stuff is actually much more intense because I have, I have no excuse for it to be any other way than how I make it, right? And that's the thing. So there's a difference between people who get better at stuff over time and people who don't. And it's really to what degree do they activate that critical faculty on their own work and, and realistically look at it and allow themselves to think that their own work is bad. If you don't allow yourself to think that your own work is bad, you have problems. Okay. Well, um, we've been uh, 75 minutes and usually we start winding now and now. So I'll take a couple more questions. Jonathan, does that make sense to you? Whatever you want to do. You know, I'm, I'm up okay. for however you want to structure it. Okay. That's good. So uh, Angelique Poe asks, what do you think of the future of AI generated art? What direction should artists be looking at? I mean, what do you want art to do, right, is the question. I'm not very much of a fan of the contemporary art scene, which is kind of like a fashion scene where it's like, you know, this artist or this year, we've got some artists who are playing with a certain kind of idea because that's what is in the, in the zeitgeist right now. Um, and we're displaying this and you know it doesn't actually matter that the art didn't take very much skill or effort to execute because the point is the idea or something right um <clears throat> that kind of art as fashion i i'm just not that interested in like sometimes the ideas displayed there could be could be interesting but um i think that a lot of a lot of what i recognize as beauty sometimes comes from difficulty of execution. Like it's it's hard to really make something just just so, so that it's beautiful, right? Um, that said, relatively abstract representations of ideas can also be beautiful, but that takes a great deal of care, I think, too, as, as well. Um, now that said, that kind of art as fashion, or, um, you know, there's this thing called conceptual art, right? It's one of these categories of, of contemporary art, which is just like, I'm just showing you the idea and I'm not doing it really any execution. Um, even with that, there's still a coherent idea behind it usually, right? And the problem with current AI is there aren't coherent ideas behind it as, as we see it, right? So these things where you use GPT-3 or whatever to do stuff, um, it can form sentences that kind of seem to make sense. But as you draw it out into a longer and longer exchange, you see that it, it really has no coherent idea of what it's actually talking about, right? And that's one of the missing pieces between AI that we have today and general AI. I think there's a number of missing pieces, but one of them is to go from this like pretending I know what I'm talking about to like actually, actually having a subject matter about which information is being supplied over time as you read through the text, right? And so the thing about these art approaches similarly is they kind of don't have that as well. They, they don't have this thing that it's about. Um, that said, the things generated could be pretty visually interesting sometimes, right? And so you can get some value out of it that way. But um, because of the lack of coherent idea, um, I'm not super much a fan. And then in terms of the execution, um, what I was saying before about execution <clears throat> effort supplying beauty or, or helping you achieve beauty is something about putting in effort to make sure something is just right with respect to its reflection of a particular idea. And if the idea isn't actually there, then what you're just getting is like visual entertainment, which which is a little bit valuable probably, but um, I I wouldn't look to AI art 
from AIs of today as anything deep, right? But maybe you could get there eventually, I don't know. Fiona L asks, as a successful independent developer, you have a lot of flexibility in how much time you spend on a project. That said, time is a finite resource for everyone. How did you decide when some aspect of your project can be safely entrusted to others without compromising your vision for the whole? That's a very contextual question. I mean, one thing, you know, as long as you're not in a race for time, one thing you can always do is just try it. Just try delegating the thing and see how it goes, right? And if it goes badly, you can undelegate it, right? And um, maybe it goes pretty well, but you're going to need to go fix some things up. That happens too. Um, however, there's something that's hard about delegation always. And um, well, you know, you know, making a game with a team is inherently an act of delegation because you have all these people, right? They're doing different categories of the game. Like, hey, I'm working on character design and animation and I'm working on environment art and I'm working on programming, right? And my job as the person uh, running the project is uh, to make sure that all these things that all the various people do are harmonious with each other <clears throat> and, uh, and combine into something that's greater than the sum of the parts, or at least that is not uh, damaging to the overall thing that the game is trying to be. Right, so that you have to have this idea of what is important about this project. Like I was talking about way at the beginning, like what are we trying to do? Uh, like what what are you know the the things that we're steering toward every time we get out our compass and ask, are we going the right direction? Right, um, and. Uh, so your job as being the person responsible for whether you succeed there or not is just making sure that all these different pieces go in the right direction. And they won't go perfectly. You can't ever, even if you're doing it yourself, you can't get perfect. And so especially when other people are doing it, it's even further from perfect. But further from perfect is often OK, right? Um, because what you really care about is harmonious or disharmonious. and many things in the world that are harmonious are also imperfect. Um, so, so your job is harmony. And so when other people do work, uh, before they do the work, you try your best to explain what you're trying to do. If it's a very subtle, hard to visualize personal thing for you, it may be very hard to explain, but you do your best. Then people come back with their first iteration of something and you'll probably be grumpy about it because it's pretty far off because when you start a new project, not everybody knows what you're doing. Even you can, you can sit there and explain. I mean, this is true about any complex topic. You can sit there and explain to somebody for an hour, here's what we're going to do. Here's why, here's the important things you talk back and forth. They go, great. I got it. Right. And then they go off, but they're going off with their understanding of what you said, not your understanding of what you said. And so you come back a couple months later and it, that understanding has drifted actually a great deal. And so you have to reestablish it a few times. Eventually people get into it and they, they kind of get what you're doing and the stuff will come out better and more homo harmonious. But a lot of what my job is prior to that time and even late into development sometimes is to be the guy who says no, who says, you know, th this thing you're doing, it's, I, I do not accept it as the person as the chief harmony officer, that's not an actual title, but like, um, I do not accept it because it does not integrate with the whole in the following way. Here's why you need to redo it. And people are grumpy about redoing things, but um, also if they really do believe that it will make the thing better, they also are not that grumpy about it, right? Because everybody hopefully on your project wants to actually do good work. Well, thank you, Jonathan. This is everybody's chance to unmute at long last so we can applaud. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Great.
So our next phase is socializing, just as at a conference when you everybody uh, goes into the hall or wherever and chats. So we have three Jitsi rooms. And you see here, you just go to this link and there are three URLs. And uh, I encourage you to move around. You know, the idea is that we're mingling and uh, everybody loves to talk to the speaker, which is great, but it's also good to meet each other. And I just suggest that you use video and your real name so that we're not talking to a blue circle with the letters JK on it, but, uh, <laughs> but somebody we know, but it is up to you. So I'm going to stay at this Google Meet for technical support if anybody has trouble with Jitsi. But you, you just need to click through to go there and uh, move over to the video rooms in the other link. So thank you very much and uh, see you on Jitsi. Thanks, everybody.